Hey, would you stand up on your feet with me today? And uh, hey, just a reminder, uh, man, you are welcome to tune in, talk to us. Hey, if you have not gone to YouTube, Generations Church of Lubbock, and liked and subscribed it, would you please start doing that? Help us get over the hump there. We're trying to, to build an audience in that area of our uh, online footprint. So help us out there. And uh, the other thing that I've just got to say, invite some, bring somebody with you to the Holy Spirit Conference. They're gonna, it, it's going to help us. It's going to change us. It's going to help them. If you'll bring them, it'll help them. Let's read Exodus chapter 34 and verse 10. Uh, It's our jumping off point for the Uncommon series. Uh, This is a a text that uh, it's after Moses has gone up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments the second time. And he had had a conversation with God and said, God said, I'm not, I'm so fed up with these people. I'm going to destroy them. I'm not going to go with them anymore. I'm not going to do anything, have anything to do with these people. Moses interceded. How many of you know? Moses changed God's mind. Do you know how important prayer is? Moses changed God's mind when he prayed. You can read this in Exodus 32. That's their rebellion. Exodus 33 is this conversation. When God decides to give them another chance, everybody say another chance. He says this about this second chance. The Lord replied, listen, I am making a covenant with you in the presence of all your people. I will perform miracles that have never been performed anywhere in all the earth or in any nation. And all the people around you will see the power of the Lord and the awesome power I will display for you. How many of you know that's a pretty big statement considering everything that got them out of Egypt? That's pretty amazing. And then I am going to uh, add to this text and refer to that a text in the New Testament today. We're talking about uncommon sacrifice. Everybody say uncommon sacrifice. This is Matthew chapter 10. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. I've included the message translation on the screen for you today to make it absolutely clear. Don't think I have come to make life cozy. I've come to cut, to make a sharp knife cut between son and father, daughter and mother, bride and mother-in-law. Cut through these cozy domestic arrangements and free you for God. Well-meaning family members can be your worst enemies. If you prefer father or mother over me, you don't deserve me. If you prefer son or daughter over me, you don't deserve me. If you don't go all the way with me through thick and thin, you don't deserve me. If you are first, if your first concern is to look after yourself, you'll never find yourself. But if you forget about yourself and look to me, you'll find both yourself and me. God, I thank you today for your word. I thank you that you're alive and well in this room. And I thank you, Lord, that you'll help me communicate with authority and clarity today. And Lord, I thank you'll help all of our online listeners tune in. And Lord, find strength in these words. Lord, help me decipher one of the most difficult sayings that Jesus has ever said in all of the New Testament. Help me bring clarity and wisdom into the life of your church today about what it means to sacrifice and why you have called your church to a life of sacrifice. And Father, that the blessing of what sacrificing is and what it will do and how it will open up the windows of heaven for our lives and how it will bring fresh life and fresh revelation into our life as we live a life of uncommon sacrifice. Father, I promise I'll give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise for what you do as a result of your spoken word today. And everybody said, you can be seated. Well, the first thing I want to do is say to you, I've shortened our saying. I was a little bit long last week, and I got to reviewing it in my notes, and I thought, I need to shorten this up so maybe people can memorize it. Not only do I want you to memorize it, I've put copies of it back there at the back for you. It looks like this. There's a green piece of paper on the back table, and it says what's on the screen today. Let's read it out loud, loudly, and together. You ready? One, 
two, three, read. Our uncommon God made an uncommon sacrifice by sending his uncommon sinless son who died an uncommon criminal's death so that we could live an uncommon life. Amen? Try to commit that to memory. Pick up one of these as you leave today and do your best to commit that to memory, okay? Everything we believe about Christianity is based on one thing, my friends. One thing, and by the way, there is an outline on the back of your bulletin that you can follow along. It looks like this. And the next slide says this. It says, everything we believe about Christianity is based on one thing, uncommon sacrifice. The sinless Son of God died for sinful, rebellious, stubborn people. That's the meaning of what Jesus said in our text. The reason he came to cut through and break and bring a sword, that's a very difficult saying. I read all kinds of commentators and stories, and there's, there's some really strange ideas about this text that's out there in the a world of writing. <laughs> and I, I just said, I got done reading all that, and I said, Lord, I just need a revelation of what it, what it means. And what it means is this, is that you and I, unless we're willing to love God more than we love our family, Unless we're willing to love God more than we love our wife. Unless we're willing to love God more than we love our children. Unless we're willing to love God more than we love anything else. We're not worthy. We've got to pick up our cross and follow God. We've got to deny ourselves and follow Jesus. And I know that's foreign to 21st century Christianity. To deny yourself anything. I think about my world travels, and I think about some of the most difficult places I've ever been in my life, and I think I've been to Mongolia 10 times, and I think one of the most difficult things that I see in Mongolia is not only are they a third, maybe a fourth world country, not only have they come out of communism and have they, have they been so backward and now are just progressing to where we were 20, 30, 40 years ago, but what I see in their life is a life of sacrifice. I'll never forget the very first time I went that I saw a young man give his life to Christ and one of the elder statesmen of, of the church at that time, which was very young. You, what you have to understand about Mong the church in Mongolia, everybody there was a first-generation Christian. It's like the book of Acts. And just now, are they becoming second-generation Christians? Every pastor was a first-generation Christian. And one of the first-generation pastors told me about this young man that gave his life to Christ in one of our services. He said, his parents will disown him for that decision. His family will more than likely kick him out of the house because they are strong. And, and, he, and I remember, I'll never forget the conversation. He lengthened the word. He said, and, and he spoke good English. He was one of the educated guys. And he, he said, they are strong Buddhists. And he will probably be put on the street. That's sacrifice. It's something you and I, and I include myself in this, we don't know anything about we don't understand it. We, don't, we, we, we can't figure that out. But when, it, when Jesus gives this very difficult saying about dividing households and even making the statement that people in your own house are going to become your worst enemies. Wow! Now, I don't know everybody's story in the room, and I certainly don't know everybody's story that's watching online, but what I do know is that some of us in this room, we don't, all of our children aren't serving God. And what you believe and what you stand for brings division in your house. And it makes it hard. It makes it difficult. It makes for a rough time at Thanksgiving. It makes for a rough time at birthdays. It's a challenge. But one of the things that I want you to know today is that God is calling us to sacrifice. God's calling us to a lifestyle of sacrifice. 
I'm going to skip some of the stuff in my notes because I just, I, I'm looking at the, the way I prepared it. I might do it in the second service, but I'm not going to do it for the first service. I, I, what I want you to do to understand, to connect the dots for you in this 21 days of prayer and fasting, I want to give you, I'm not a teacher. I'm not, I can't hold you accountable for this. It's not like you're in school. But I, I would hope and I would suggest, strongly suggest, that you leave this service today and go home and read Isaiah 58. And what happens in Isaiah 58, it opens up about with, with the first prayer, blow a trumpet, make a sound, you know. And blowing a trumpet in those days was a call to worship for the church. And they were probably, when it says blow the trumpet, they were probably talking about blowing a shofar, a ram's horn, and making the noise. And it was a symbol that they called the church to a place of, of unity and a place of worship. And it talks about that. And God starts talking to the people uh, through Isaiah. And he says, you're fasting and you're doing all these religious things. But I'm not listening. Because while you're fasting and while you're praying, you're still serving yourself. Now, I'm paraphrasing. You're going to have to go home and read this. While you're fasting and while you're praying and while you're doing your religious stuff, you're still serving yourself. The fast that I want is where you deny yourself and you reach out to the widow. You reach out to the poor. You reach out to the naked. You reach out to the bound and the bruised. And you, you do something for people Basically, here, here's my paraphrase. You do something for people, they can't pay you back. You sacrifice. You sacrifice. That's the fast that God desires. It's not just that you don't watch TV. It's not just that you fast ESPN. It's not just that you go on a Daniel fast. It's not just that you, you there, whatever fast you're doing, and it's none of my business, but it's not that you're sacrificing food. It's that you're sacrificing food and spending that time with the Lord and then you're doing something that costs you something. Sacrifice. And it's so uncommon in our world. It's so uncommon in 21st century Christianity. We are consumers by nature. You know what a consumer Christianity is? You think this is a, a, a 7-Eleven. You just roll in here and get what you want and roll out. It's convenient. God calls us to live for him 24-7, 365. And my friends, that is a life of sacrifice. To live for Jesus 24-7, 365 is a sacrifice. It's, it's the very definition of pick up your cross and follow me. I don't know. I, maybe I'm just a simple-minded preacher. But when I hear that phrase, it always makes me think about here's horizontally is the way I'm living and the way I'm walking. And the cross the vertical part of the cross is God's will and God's way. And it's where I'm going along my path. And all of a sudden, the cross intersects. And I pick up my cross and I do it his way, not my way. Maybe that's just too simple. And not theological enough. But that's what God's calling us to. It's what Jesus said in the, you know what? It's what Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane, and I've gone way off the rails here from my notes. But here's the deal. It's what God said in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said this three times. God, I, Dad, I'm not sure I can do this. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will. That's the, all of our Christianity is based on sacrifice sacrifice and that is in 21st century Christianity in America that's almost a cuss word because we don't want to give up anything give me an hour long service make sure you take care of my kids Make sure you care, take care of my teenagers. Don't preach anything. Don't preach on sin. Don't make me feel uncomfortable. Don't ask me to give up anything. Don't step on my toes. Heard a preacher say one time, it's my job to step on your toes because you walk on the bottoms. It's my job to walk on the tops. I that wouldn't go over well in this culture. I want to 
talk to you today about the word tension. Everybody say tension. Ish and Steve, I need y'all's help. No, you're not going to work out. Y'all, one of you, that'll stretch. Ish, get on that, that side of the carpet. Steve, get on that side of the carpet. <laughs> There's tension on that band, that workout band, right? And they could take one step back and bring more tension, right? So there's tension between good and evil. There's tension between right and wrong. There's tension between holy and unholy. There's tension between God and family. There's tension between self and God. There's tension. You feel it and I feel it, right? Now, the option de in dealing with tension, you can compromise. Y'all move together. Keep coming. Keep coming. Keep. There's no tension. They've compromised. Right? So, if it's holy and unholy, they've come to the middle and they've compromised and it's nothing. There's no impact. There's no benefit. If it's right, if it's wrong. And, and this is what Matthew 10, 34 through 39 is talking about. That if you love your wife more than you love God, if you love your husband more than you love God, if you love your kids more than you love God, if you've got anything in front of God, you're not worthy of me is what it said. And there's, keep going back again, go stand on the carpet. There's a tension in that. Isn't there? And sometimes, take one more step back. Sometimes there's a lot of tension in that. Yeah, don't let go, boys. And sometimes, y'all come together again? Sometimes the tension gets stronger. Put that in your other hand. Now go back. Now go back. Now this one, you can feel it, can't you? You can feel the difference from one hand to the other. There's certain issues that, that this is easier to pull. It's not as strained. It's not as difficult. This one is a little more difficult, a little, little bit, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A little bit more challenging. And so there's certain issues that come up in our lives that the tension of those things is difficult. Y'all come to the middle and just rest a minute. Y'all are going to help me preach for a while. Y'all just stay there. Now, here I go. I'm taking, I don't usually do stuff like this. I try to stay out of this lane, but I just... I was so moved and so convicted by what I heard this week, I have to wade into this pool. The next slide talks about Jojo Siwa. She is a child star from Nickelodeon. She's a singer and a star of a show called Dance Moms. She became, started being famous when she was 10 years old. She is now 18 years old. You'll see on the screen, she has 12.1 million YouTube subscribers. To put that in perspective, Generations Church has 98. <laughs> she has 31.3 million followers. Her total views between YouTube on YouTube, this is, this is just YouTube. This is not Instagram. This is not Twitter. This is not Facebook. This is just YouTube, folks. She has 3.4 billion views. She surpassed the Beatles in popularity. In 2020, she was included in Time's annual list of the 100 most influential people in the world. She's up in the title. She's what's known as a child influencer. 
How many of you heard the term influencer when it comes to social media? Okay. She, at first, in 2020, she came out as a homosexual or a lesbian. Here in 2021, she came out as pansexual. I don't even know what that is. So I had to go. I searched it. And guess what I found out? I found out WebMD. That's where I found the definition is WebMD. Are you ready for this? Look at the definition. WebMD says, Pansexuality is the romantic, emotional, or sexual attraction to people regardless of their gender. Like everyone else, pansexual people may be attracted to some people and not others, but the gender of the person does not matter. People of any gender identity can do can do identify as pansexual. They use the term bisexual and pansexual interchangeably, but there are no distinctions. Or there are distinctions, I'm sorry. Jojo Siwa is coming to Lubbock. To the United Supermarkets Arena. There are billboards, there's radio commercials. You know, I don't have a lot of authority over stuff like that, but as a pastor, I'm a spiritual gatekeeper in the city. Yes, I pastor you. If you allow me to do that, it's a privilege. But I believe above and beyond my calling as a, as a lead pastor in Lubbock, Texas, I am a gatekeeper. And I believe that God has put it in my heart. Ever every since I heard this on Friday, I've had such a burden in my heart. It's been a part of my prayer life. I, there's a lot of times I haven't known what to pray, so I just prayed in the Spirit. But I do not want a person like this influencing young ladies in our city. Amen. I don't want a person like this influencing my granddaughters. I don't want a person like this that has this kind of, of demonic... Yes, I said it. Satanic, evil agenda. I want you to join with me this morning. And from this day forward, step apart, brothers. Bring some tension, guys. You know what? The issue I'm talking about right now brings a cultural tension. And guess where, guess where the cultural tension is? It's in your house. Because your girls want to watch this girl. She's cool. She's popular. She dances good. She sings good. All of your daughters, all of their friends are watching her. They're talking about her. They're hearing other people talk about her. And it brings tension into your house. Mom and Dad, you've got decisions to make that may not be popular with your kids. You've got to love God more than you want them to like you. I've always, and I've got one of my children sitting in this room. I've always told my kids, listen, I will be your worst nightmare until you're 25 and then we'll be friends. You'll have kids and we'll go play golf together. But I will not be your friend. I'm your, your father. And this tension in our relationship is going to be there because I'm more afraid of God than I am of you. Are you hearing my heart this morning? Young people that are in this room, if your parents are tough on you, if your parents draw the line, if your parents say you can't do this and you can't do that, one of the things that I, I want to instruct you, mom and dad, don't say just because I said so. Give them a reason. Give them a biblical, scriptural reason why you can't watch JoJo Siwa. Because she has a satanic agenda. And she's leading people down a wrong path. You can relax, gentlemen. On the other hand, I read 
This week, the Governor Greg Abbott of Texas has put, signed a law into effect that goes into effect January the 18th, goes into effect Tuesday, that if a young person in the school system of Texas, if they participate in sports, it's a law. It's signed into law. They must participate in the gender that is on their biological birth certificate. Come on. Now that's what I'm talking about. Back up. There's some tension over that decision. There's some cultural tension. But remember what I said. There's right, there's wrong, there's holy, there's unholy. There's self and there's God. There's sin and there's holiness. There's always going to be tension. Friends, you can't get away from it. Quit trying. Because if you want to get away from tension, from tension what's, the, what's the deal? Compromise. Compromise. You relax. Let's do it. You men stay right there. Y'all are going to keep helping me preach. God, we pray for this concert. I don't even know what they're calling it. Lord, we pray that it gets canceled. We pray that something happens, that it goes away, it gets canceled, that that influence will not enter this city. We pray by the blood of Jesus and the authority of God's word. We shut the devil's plans up. Lord, we, we, we know it's a demonic spirit. That, that let, Jojo is influenced by demonic spirits that are drawing her into deception. We bind up the devil. He's a liar. He's a loser. Lord, we pray that Jojo would get saved. Lord, that somebody would come across her path. Lord, there would be multiple divine appointments that would flip the script on her. And Lord, that she would be an influencer for the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Are y'all okay? Steve, are you okay? Okay. I'm making you stand up a long time, I know. You know, revivals happen. Back up, gentlemen. Revivals happen. In places of tension. Revivals come together, guys. Revivals don't happen in the atmosphere of compromise. Revivals happen, back up, guys, when people feel the unholy and the holy, the right and the wrong, and the, and the right. Here, here's what happens. Here's what happens. They, the, the, the holy, the right, the God side of things decides we're going to be different. We're going to pray. We're going to live for God. They don't let go. They don't let go. There's always going to be that tension. You can't Listen, if you let go, come together. I don't want you to hurt each other. Let go of the red one. If you let go, you've disengaged with the people that you can help. So pick it back up, Steve. You don't want to disengage from the, un, I'm sorry, it's the unholy, the wrong, the sin. <laughs> you don't want to disengage. Because back up, guys, because even in the tension, you can impact. You can impact this side. Amen? Yeah. You could, you could all of those influences, all of those hits, all of those things that she's doing. So number one on your outline. Y'all relax just a second, guys. Number one. There's a tension between family and our obedience to God. I've already said this. I've gotten ahead of myself. I'm not going to beat this like a dead horse. But we've got to love God more than we love our wife, our kids, our friends. We've got to love God more than we love our employer. We've got to love God more than we love people liking us. Hello? Did you hear what I just said? We've got to love God more than we love people liking us. We've got to raise a standard of righteousness in our home first. I think that's why Jesus told this story. This, not, it's not a story. It's why Jesus made this fact. We've got to love God more than we love our families. <coughs> Listen, I've said it hundreds of times, and I'm going to say it one more time. 
If your Christianity doesn't work in your house, it doesn't work at all. Sin is out there. Sin is rampant. I remember in my very first church that I ever pastored, I had a man that started coming to our church. He was a former banker, but he'd gone to prison for embezzling money. And he, by the time he came to our church, he was out of prison, and God was speaking to him to start a prison ministry. He did. His kids didn't, they didn't buy in because they said, we saw what old dad was like. Dad got saved in prison. Dad got out of prison and was all in for Jesus. <coughs> and they didn't get that. Some of the kids, some of the kids, they had daughters and son and one son. And they, the, the, the kids all at one point or another went a little wonky. And, and I'm in, in fairly close relationship with the son today, and he loves God. He loves Jesus. He's serving Jesus. But that tension. Dad brought tension into the home because he wanted to serve God. He wanted to do right, not do wrong. And they're like, oh, man, where, where, what happened to our old dad? And it, and it pushed the kids away. But you know what? It's going to happen. I'm just telling you, I, I, I would be lying to you if I told you it wasn't going to happen. Become a, becoming a Christian is easy, but living the Christian life is not easy. There's tension at all times. You can relax. Romans chapter 1 and verse 32 talks about this tension. You can add Romans chapter 1 to your Bible reading assignment that I've given you if you are willing to do homework that your pastor gives you. And you're, you, you might be familiar with Romans 1. It talks all about the different sins that there are in the world. Lying, envy, adultery, murder. It even talks about the sin of homosexuality. It calls it unnatural. That, that men have traded the, the natural use for the, of their bodies for an unnatural use. And, it, and it, so it's just so plain about what's wrong and what's right. And it gets down to Romans 132, and look at this. This is just, it's always blown me away when I read it. It convicts me all over again. It says, and although they know the ordinances of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, that they not only do the same, but also have hearty, give hearty approval to those who practice them. What they're saying is, it's the people that do it and the people that give approval to it. So if you've compromised, if you give approval to Jojo Siwa and all of her influence in your household, you give approval to that according to the scripture, you're under the same judgment she is. Hello? Don't get mad. Hey, I am Ed. I am your friend. Don't get mad at me. I did not write it. I just read it. But when you give approval, you say, well, what should my... Back up. In the tension of those things, we, in the tension of good and evil, holy and unholy, right and wrong, in the tension, we love and we accept, but we do not give approval. If we give approval, we compromise. This is the tension in your household, mom and dad. I mean, <sighs> marriage, living together, drinking. <sighs> I mean, I'm not just going to go down the list and calling out sins, but when you compromise, when you, when you come together and you, you let go of the tension, you open the door to the enemy. Well, we love each other. We're going to get married. We're going to get married, so we can just go ahead and have sex together. Compromise. But when you, the tension in the relationship, Hey, here, here's another tension for you. Saved and unsaved. You get in a relationship. You get, yeah, there's, there's pull. There's, there's real pull. Saved, unsaved. Well, the unsaved's trying to pull the saved. Where? And the saved's trying to...
Listen, God is speaking to you, church. My friends online, God is speaking to you today. He's speaking clearly to all of us. And you've, somewhere, you've got to get to the place Jesus got in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but your will. Here's my second point. There's a tension between living for self and living for God. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It is totally reasonable for you to sacrifice. God is not requiring something from you that is unreasonable. The text says it. It is your reasonable service unto God to sacrifice your will for his will. It's not unnatural. Hey, it's not even uncommon. It's God's plan. It's God's perfect will for your life to live the tension. The ten, every time I say tension, y'all do tension every time. Okay. The, the, the tension is natural. Say, oh, Pastor, I'm tired of the tension. It's what being a Christian's all about. God's grace, God's power, God's word. That's why you need God's word. That's why you need God's church. That's why you need godly relationships. That's why you can't be isolated from God's people because you've got to have a way to handle this tension and you can't do it by yourself. My third point and final point is there's tension between the easy way and the hard way. I'm going to tell you a story it blew me away. I had to check it out. I went and checked this story out because I heard another person tell it, and I didn't know if it was true. Some of you have heard about this story. In Allen, Texas, just north of, of Plano, the, they built the largest high school football stadium in the United States of America. It cost $60 million, a high school football stadium. Seats 18,000 people. Well, when they got it built and got it inspected, the inspector said, you can't, come, you can't play football in here. The, the, underneath the, the bleachers are all these concrete cracks. And my research showed the concrete cracks. The, the, I don't mind saying the, the architect was PBK, Pogue Construction. And get this, what I found out. I heard the story. I didn't believe it. I researched it. That Pogue Construction, that built the stadium, they fixed the cracks, cost them $10 million. They didn't charge it to Allen Independent School District or the taxpayers of Allen. Not only did they fix the cracks and no charge, but they gave, gave them $2.5 million in lost revenue because the stadium wasn't open on time. Guess what? Pogue Construction, they're all Christ followers. They chose the hard way, not the easy way. They did the right thing the right way at the right time because they loved Jesus and there was a tension. How many of you know they could have compromised and said, y'all approve this design. Y'all approve this. Y'all inspected this. But no, the tension of doing the right thing or the wrong thing. And because they, believe, they named Jesus as their Savior, because they call themselves a Christian company, because they believe in doing the right thing, they spent all that money. Jesus said this. Look at this text. Be up on the screen for you. You can relax, guys. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. The easy way or the hard way, the broad way or the narrow way, listen to what Eugene Peterson says in the message translation. Don't look for shortcuts to God. The market is flooded with surefire, easy-going formulas for successful life that can be practiced in your spare time. Don't fall for all that stuff. Even though the crowds of people do, the way to life to God is vigorous and requires your total attention. Man, I love that. The way to God is filled with tension. Yeah, you get saved. It's easy to raise your hand and pray the prayer, but immediately there's tension. Wow. 
You guys are done preaching. Thank you. Thanks for helping Pastor preach today. <laughs> yeah, they got to work out. There's this amazing story in the Bible. It's in John 21. We're going to look at a couple of verses of it in just a second as I close. Peter has denied Jesus. We're familiar with the story, right? He says, Jesus, Peter declares loudly, I'll follow you, Lord. Wherever you go, whatever happens, Jesus looks at him and said, after the cock crows three times, you'll deny me. He denied him and his crowing rooster. <laughs> I mean, you know, thank God Jesus kills your crowing rooster, right? <laughs> the times we've denied the Lord. Well, Jesus, Peter completely backslides and he goes back to fishing. That's what happens in John 21. He gets his buddies, he goes back out on the lake and they're fishing. I don't know, I just envision them taking a Yeti full of Bud Light and fishing. <laughs> Going back to fishing. Going back to their old way of life. Peter looks up. Jesus is on the beach cooking breakfast. Peter's so excited, he jumps out of the boat in his underwear. Runs to the shore. Said, Master, what are you doing? Jesus loves him. And it's the classic scripture where Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my sheep. Amen. Says it a third time, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my sheep. That's the background to these verses. Look at John chapter 21. Truly, truly. At, let, now, wait, let me just set this up. There's no interlude between what I just described. The verses right above verse 18 are the verses where they're having the conversation, do you love me? So there's no exclamation, there's no explanation why Jesus goes from that to this. There's no therefore, what for, how to. He just goes to it. Look what he says. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. What this is, that's a prophecy about how Peter's going to die. And if you don't know, if you've never read about it, Peter died on a cross just like Jesus, except it was upside down. Now listen to the next phrase. Now this, he said, signifying of what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Sound familiar? Matthew chapter 10. If you love your wife, your kids, your family, no, you got, you got to deny yourself. you got to follow me. you got to sacrifice. So Peter, how many of you know Peter has a mouth problem? Peter says, he's true to form, he hasn't changed yet. He says, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. That's John. The one who also leaned back on the bosom of the, uh, at the supper said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? That's one question. So Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? In other words, you've told me how I'm going to die. How's he going to die? <laughs> Listen to what Jesus says. I love this. Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. You cannot compare yourself to the sacrifice of others. You have got to. You must. We must. We must. We must. Not we should. We must follow Jesus on our track and not look at what somebody else is doing. Jesus. 
you to bow your head and close your eyes with me for a moment. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the privilege to preach your word this morning. Lord, I sense your anointing in this room. I sense the power of the Holy Spirit speaking to people's lives about the tension of right and wrong, good and evil, holy and unholy, self and God, God's will and my will. Lord, I sent you speaking to people's hearts. Lord, I pray that my brothers and sisters that have heard your voice would just simply come to the place of surrender. Lord, I am convinced and convicted that there, as long as we, as, as we live on this planet, as long as we as Christ followers live on this planet, there will always be tension between holy and unholy, right and wrong, good and evil. We'll never escape it. So Lord, help us to raise the banner of righteousness. Live for God, love and accept people, but never find ourselves giving approval to evil. Give us the courage to live by our uncommon convictions like we talked about last week. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I want you to look at it me for a moment. We're going to sing a song. And while we're singing, I believe there's some of you that are living under such tension that you need to come to the place. You've compromised. You've, you've let the slack in the rope because you're tired of fighting. You're tired of, you're in, you may be in the position of compromise. Maybe you're in the position of tension and you need courage and you need strength. I don't know where you're at. And I'm not going to embarrass you and I'm not going to define which one you are. But here's what I believe. I believe you need to take a step of faith and ask God to help you. And while we're singing, I believe you need to come lie in the front right here. And I'm not going to come lay hands on you. Nobody's. I think you just need to say, Jesus, I surrender. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. That needs to be your prayer this morning. So I want you to stand up on your feet with me today. I want you to sing this song, and if the Lord is speaking to you and you need to do business, you can feel free to kneel at a prayer rail. You can come and just stand and surrender. But please, please be obedient to God. Be obedient to Jesus.